Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 18th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what Bruce Tangeman's resignation as Revenue Commissioner likely means for state fiscal policy. Second, why we won't get spending under control as long as we rely on, T on PFD cuts and why we will if we use a mechanism that taxes the top 20%. And third, why continued low bond yields are likely to have a big adverse impact on Alaska. And now let's join Michael. Three big things. And the first one is, I think, kind of the obvious thing in the room. Uh, and that is, of course, the departure of Bruce Tangeman. Uh, as Commissioner of Revenue, and he went out uh, with this opinion piece on his way out, uh, and the thing that caught my attention on the opinion piece is the comment in there that say, said basically that, uh, you know, that any taxation issue is going to have to be, is going to have to go through his department. His department would be at the heart of it, and he wanted the governor to have somebody who is 100% aligned with his vision. That gives me some pause. Give me your thoughts on the departure of Tangiman and what it means uh, for the Dunleavy administration, in your view, moving forward and where we go from here? Well, Bruce has been around a long time. He uh, was staffed uh, Pete Kelly and and uh, Anna McKinnon on uh, uh, the Senate Finance Committee uh, back in the day. He's been at AGDC. He's been uh, uh, several different places and, and really, I think, has a fairly good feel uh, about how Alaska government operates, both at the uh, legislative level and at the administrative level. And what I'm really, what I what I take from Bruce's resignation, and particularly, uh, you don't have to read between the lines very hard to his opinion piece in the in the ADN uh, when he uh, resigned to to really understand what's going on. I think Bruce sees that uh, cuts only, the approach of cuts only, uh, isn't going to work uh, to balance government. I think he's seeing that both from his experience. Uh, in, in the executive branch, as well as his experience, past experience in the legislative branch. Um, and, and, and with that, uh, I think he also sees the governor's commitment to the PFD uh, to, be, to be continuing and strong and resolute and the government and the governor intending on, on finding a way to keep the PFD alive. And, and the squeeze out of that is that means you have to, if, if, you, if cuts only isn't going to work, um, and if you're committed to keeping the PFD, the squeeze out of that is you have to fund government some other way. If you're not going to fund it through uh, PFD cuts, you have to fund government some other way. And funding government some other way means some other form of taxes. PFD cuts, of course, are taxes themselves, but, but funding government some other way means some other form of taxes. Um, and that has to come through revenue, uh, whether it's uh, uh, oil taxes, which he sort of hints at, uh, in the piece, or it's another form of individual uh, tax. It comes through the Department of Revenue. And frankly, I think Bruce saw what happened to uh, uh, Donna and to Ed King uh, last year in front of the legislature as they as they defended cuts only, the administration's cuts only approach. He sort of saw that and he sort of looked at uh, what uh, what was ahead for him uh, if he came into the legislature and uh, talked about uh, uh, faced the reality of cuts only and talked about you know other revenue options, 
uh, and he decided it was time to pull the parachute <laughs> that that life was too short uh, to go through that sort of thing. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, I, if you take these jobs, if you take these jobs in government, uh, you have to, uh, you, you, you really, you, you have an undertaking uh, to live with the good and the bad in it. I, I was not the most happy camper in the world when Bruce got named as a, as commissioner of revenue, looking at his past with Pete and Anna, um, I was skeptical about his commitment to the PFD and skeptical about his commitment to, to, you know, being a big advocate of that inside government. Uh, but I was told at the time by those close to Dunleavy, you know, he wouldn't take the job if he wasn't committed to the governor's agenda, if he wasn't, you know, going to, going to stand with the governor through this stuff. Um, and I've, I, I, frankly, I'm a little disappointed to see, you know, Bruce having taken the job, sort of pull the parachute at the time when the when it's the revenue commissioners, it's going to be the revenue commissioners turn in the barrel. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's what it says. It says um, cuts only isn't going to work. Uh, the governor's committed to the PFD. Uh, that means it's going to be my turn in the barrel, and right. I don't want to be there. Right. Um, I thought it was, it was ironic that in the ADN story that the picture up there is like the three wise men of Don Arduin and Ed King and Bruce Tangeman. And it was like, I think you pointed out that two of the three is now gone and now three of the three is now gone. I think, again, <clears throat> just the absolute hostility and grilling. I, I think that that I think you're right. I think that plays a huge part into that uh, just because of the way that they were all uh, treated during the uh, during the process. Uh, which, uh, you know, um, a couple of, you know, they've taken it and they did it with aplomb, but at the same time, ain't nobody got time for that in the long run. You know what I mean? When it's, when it's all said and done, it does, nobody wants to get the ultimate grilling and, and all the blame laid at their feet. Yeah. And, and Bruce didn't get much of that last session. I mean, it mostly focused in on, because, because the governor was on the cuts only path. It mostly focused in on Donna, um, and Ed, uh, and Bruce really escaped that. And and some of that is because he's from the legislature. Some of that was they weren't going to do that to him uh, in the way they were doing it to uh, Donna and to Ed, who Donna certainly being from outside didn't right. have those didn't have those relationships. Ed being fairly young uh, didn't have those relationships. But Ed having or uh, uh, Bruce having had that long re re relationship in the legislature, they weren't going to do that to him. But I. I think he saw the writing on the wall that he was going to be the crunch point uh, this time through, and just it just really wasn't do it. Doesn't want to do it. So I, I think that means I think that means you know whoever succeeds Bruce as commissioner of revenue is is going to take on a job of of justifying and explaining uh, if you're not going to do cuts only, um, then then this is where you're going to have to go. Uh, and is going to take on the job of of defending uh, the the sort of you know if we're not going to cut the PFD we're not going to do cuts only this is where we're going to go and is going to take on the job of defending that and it's going to be a difficult job and legislators are going to use that person for a pinata um, right. uh, through this session just like they did Donna and Ed uh, last session. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. A couple things stood out in this piece that uh, Ed, that uh, uh, Bruce Tangeman wrote. Um, and he talks a little bit about, <clears throat> you know, sticking to the governor's plan, reducing the size of government. The governor did exactly what he uh, what he had said that he would do, uh, that the governor still believes in those principles. And then he talks about, you know, that, that he talks a little bit about the past and says we've been, you know, we've had the ability uh, and the cash to be all things to all people. And that money, many have come to realize that it's one hell of a run, but things must change, while many others think that this gravy train can just keep chugging. And I think that's kind of the crux to the matter here. He understands that this is a simple math equation in the long run, and something has got to be different, but that there is just not the political will to change it in the way that, that it needs to be changed, to stop being all things to all people. Yeah, it's it, there is not the political will. I mean, I... I, I appreciate there are people who listen to the show and people in the comment chat room who will now sort of explode. But but there's not the political will at the legislature to 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 do cuts only. And and it's not just it's not just uh, Natasha and Bert and others at the head of finance. The governor, as we as we talked about ad nauseum on the show uh, in the past, there weren't 16 
out of 60 in the legislature who were willing to stand with the governor uh, on vetoes to the level necessary to, to do this through cuts only. There weren't 16 in the legislature. And, and we can talk about, you know, this coming election cycle and, you know, electing new people, but, but it, it's, it is unlikely we will get to 16. Right. We're, we're certainly not at 16 this session. Right. So, well, well, so, it's... so this session we're going to have to confront the fact we're not at 16. Well, and then he goes on to say something else, though, and, I, and I, I think I have to agree with him in this case. He goes, step one in fixing the problem must continue to be fiscal discipline in order to get our spending habits adjusted. That must be accomplished well before we implement any sort of tax. My concern is that once a tax is on the books, the budget in place at that time will be the new base going forward. Cutting below that will be nearly impossible, and the budget will only go up from there. And I think that that is you know, that synopsizes the main concern of people who are uh, who are afraid of any kind of taxation discussion, that if we give them more money, they will just go up from here uh, and they won't look at cuts anymore. And it is a valid concern. Well, but Michael, I, we already have we already have taxes. I mean, that's what PFD cuts are. Um, and we already have that pot of money opened up. I, we'll talk in the second segment about some of the things I some of the things I think about that. But um, we already we already have a tax uh, and we already have an escape valve. Uh, certainly for the top 20 percent about how they're going to continue to fund fund government yes we need to keep the pressure on on cutting spending but to do that you've got to have everybody's everybody's head in the game of cutting spending and right now we don't uh the top 20 percent don't have uh, uh any reason to really spend political capital on cutting spending they can talk about it they can you know put out you know great grand visions about how they're going to cut spending. Uh, but at the end of the day, they're not going to spend political capital uh, on cutting spending because they don't have to pay for it. Right. Uh, and they don't have to pay. They're not going to have to pay for it for quite a while. And until we get everybody's head in the game uh, about cutting spending, that's not going to occur. Uh, the Bruce is exactly right. The governor's exactly right. Everybody's exactly right that we need to have we need to have uh, uh, fiscal discipline on the spending side. But we're, we don't have a system that exists to do that right now. There's not there's not it, it, it is it is sort of a voluntary plan to cut on the top 20 percent and they'll do it at the margins. But there's no drive on the part of the top 20 percent uh, to make those cuts. And, you know, 80 percent of the legislature legislature 80% of the legislators in the legislature uh, are in the top 20%. So they're not feeling it themselves. They're not feeling the need uh, to make these cuts because they found another way around that that, right. will, that will go on for quite a while. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, you're talking about the top 20%, which seems to be a natural segue into number two, but I do want to quickly synopsize the, the departure of Tangibin. Care to tell me what you think this means for the budgets coming up in this? What does this tell you about the upcoming budget cycle? Do you foresee the governor just flat out coming out with some form of new revenue in the budget itself, or what? what, what are your thoughts here? If I were governor, I would come out with an alternative budget. I would come out with a budget that said that that was once again cuts only, um, uh, and said this is this is what I think we need to do. But if we're not going to do that, then this is how we need to pay for it. If you guys aren't going to cut this amount, this is how we need to pay for it, and flat out put that put that choice on the legislature from the front, so that so that it's clear they're talking about either taxes. Uh, or they're talking about, uh, or they're talking about making deeper cuts, and I think that would actually incentivize uh, deeper cuts. I don't know if the governor is going to do that. I think what Bruce's resignation means more uh, is about is about his view of what the legislature is doing this coming session, and I think his view is that, that the legislature is not going to make the cuts. That's going to increase. That's going to create the need for some form of revenues. The governor is going to continue to say. Uh, that we're going to preserve the PFD and he's not going to cut the PFD. Uh, and that's going to put whoever the revenue commissioner is right in the middle, right in the firing line of, uh, of how are you going to raise the revenue uh, to, to fund government if, if, you're, if you're not going to do PFD cuts. And I, and I think what Bruce's resignation really says is I don't want to be there. I, I don't want to. I'm, Bruce's, I'm Bru Bruce. I'm young enough to have, to have aspirations to do other things in government in the future. And I don't want to be the one that gets you know, my, myself killed uh, uh, this session. I saw what happened to Donna and I saw what happened to Ed. So I, I think that's really what 
what what what Bruce's resignation is telling us. Uh, Jonathan says, "What is the top twenty percent as far as household income?" Brad, what are you considering when you're looking at this? What do the economists consider to be the top twenty percent as far as the breakoff point for income? You know, I'm going to look that up right as we're talking. My 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 quick recollection is about 125,000 household income. Yeah, I was going to say uh, is is what ITEP uses. But let me look that up as we're talking. James says the governor's plan last year w- was not a cuts only approach, as it contained. Uh, SB 57, which repatriates approximately $439 million of funds supplanted by organized areas taxing the pipeline. For perspective, this amounts to uh, this amount of dollars is over twice what Walker's income proposed income tax was. This sparsely populated organized areas, which take the lion's share of the 439, are padding the separate permanent funds of the North Slope Borough and Valdez. He says it wasn't a cuts only approach. Um which I mean, I guess it could be argued in that direction, but at the same time, uh, you know, even even with those, even taking those cuts out, it never it was never going to reach an even balance point anyway. It was just a start. Yeah, that that's about that was about four hundred million out of a one point three billion dollar um, uh, deficit that the governor was going to offset the one point three with nine hundred million dollars plus or minus uh, in cuts and four hundred million, but. But but <laughs> that that revenue side uh, is a was a complete non-starter. It didn't even get a hearing in uh, in either uh, legislative body. Uh, uh, ASRC, which had been a big uh, supporter of the governor, uh, reversed and 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 came out blasting the governor as a result of that. Uh, it's it's a it's a. I mean, basically, what you're saying is we're going to take a lot of money from. Uh, from uh, the North Slope Borough, from uh, the Fairbanks North Star Borough, and from the Kenai Borough, uh, and we're going to give that to, to the state, and the state uh, can then spend it. Um, and that sort of leaves the those boroughs then with uh, with sort of a hole in their budget. Um, right. So it's, I mean, it's it's yeah, yeah. <clears throat> the governor did come up with four hundred million dollars that way, but it was a non-starter. And so what you were left with was uh, was cuts only to to get to the get to the spending levels that uh, that the governor proposed. What is the top uh, 20%, Brad? Did you get a chance it to see? It is $115,000 family income according to 115,000 and up family income, household income according to uh, the ITEP study, the 2017 ITEP study. Yeah, which I think actually puts higher than 80% of the legislature. I want to say it's closer to something like 95% of the legislature is top 20% or more. I think there's only like three or four legislators that make less than a hundred thousand bucks a year. Yeah, it's. I mean, le- legislative salary itself is like sixty thousand. So even if you only have, or sixty five thousand. So even if you only have, uh, even if that's your only job, you're well on your way there. Uh, if your if your family, if the household income uh, from investments or from other things add to that. I, I I did an analysis of the of the legislature, and I came up with eighty percent using that. Uh, using the hundred and fifteen thousand dollar figure, but you know it it could be uh, it could be off one way or the other. Right. Um, we're coming down to it here. Uh, we got about uh, two minutes here left. Um, income tax is a starter for this legislature, and we have a governor that's going to sign it. Says James, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think that the governor. Uh, I, I don't think that's what the governor wants. Quite honestly, uh, but the problem is obviously there's there there is no will to to uh, put the cuts in place that need to be done. As Brad has pointed out, 16 couldn't stand with the governor on a lot of these smaller cuts. I mean, for God's sakes, we 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 put money back into the Arts Council, hundreds of thousands of dollars back into the Arts Council of all things. Uh, I mean, if that if that's not an indicator of political will, I don't know what is. Yeah, we've got, I mean, the revenue's got to come from somewhere. Somebody's going to get taxed. It's either going to be through a PFD tax or it's going to be through a tax on future generations by by spending down the earnings reserve and reducing the 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 investment fund that's there to generate returns for future generations, or it's going to be a tax on on the current generation. Frankly, I think it ought to be a tax on the current generation. I think, as we'll talk about in the segment upcoming, uh, I think that's what's going to motivate that that's what would best motivate behavior. Uh, but there's going to be a tax on somebody. It's it's not going to be we're not going to get out of this. 
scot free. There's no, there's no, you know, the the oil price cavalry isn't coming over the hill. Frankly, the cuts only cam- cavalry uh, isn't coming over the hill. We're not going to get out of this scot free. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Uh, just looking at the last couple of questions here. Um, tax equals pay cut, cost of living increase, and revenue loss mechanism all in one swoop. Uh, and again, without the without the backing of uh, of of a cuts only crowd, which I mean, I would love to see, but without that backing, we're just not going to see you know that go anywhere. It will just, I think, at this point, it's going to lead to more gridlock. The only thing that's going to change that is a changing of the players. And that is the only thing that we can hope for in this next election cycle, even if we have a stalling tactic for this next session, is a stalling tactic of uh, before we get into the election season. That's what we're going to have to look for. The second of the weekly top three was why the fact that the top 20 percent isn't contributing to the cost of state government actually matters. Brad Keithley, our guest, returns to discuss that. Brad, uh, number two. Well, I, I, I took a look at... Um, at, at some numbers that sort of uh, uh, presuppose that we don't have uh, a tax on the top 20 percent, that we continue to use PFD cuts and sort of analyzed where, where that where that leads us. We've got over the course of the next 10 years, the projections are we will have about 2.1 billion per year uh, in, in under the statute, under the current statute that we go to the PFD. Some people appear willing to, to, to let, sort of ride down the PFD, let the legislature continue cutting the PFD as a way of, of funding government um, and, and let that continue. And, and going down that road uh, just, just ensures that cuts, serious cuts won't happen. The reason is this, uh, the top 20% are, as we were just discussing, is, is by far the majority in the legislature. They are by far the majority in the donor class. If they don't feel the impact of of funding government, if they can if they can shove the 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 funding of government off on PFD cuts, and they don't feel the impact of of government uh, of 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 having to pay to to support government, then they're not going to spend the political capital it takes to to achieve cuts. Only they will continue to to give uh, lip service to to the the, the 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 effort to cut to, to cut spending but they will not spend the political capital it takes necessary to push back on the unions uh, to push back on uh, the social services to push back on uh, people like the Rasmussen Foundation that continue to want uh, government spending to push back on the on K through 12 to push back on the university they won't spend the political capital to do that they will simply say well we know we should be cutting government or we know we should be doing this but uh, but the PFD was there all along to help fund government we'll just take another chunk out of the PFD uh, and 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 continue to fund government that way the PFD is like a, is like is a is like a two billion dollar uh, slush fund when you look at it that way, the PFD is like a $2 billion slush fund. And, and they will continue to ride down that uh, ride down that slush fund, what in their view is a slush fund. They'll continue to ride down that slush fund to continue, to continue funding government. The governor is committed to putting a stop to that and preserving the PFD. But if he can't get 16 in the legislature uh, to, uh, to agree to a cuts-only agenda, uh, then – that's not going to happen. But they will just continue writing down, uh, writing down the PFD. It would be different if we had a tax that a tax approach, and the PFD is a tax. It's a tax on middle and lower income Alaska families. It would be different if we had a tax that reached the top 20 percent. Um, and if we did, if the top 20 percent had to pay a share, their share uh, of of the cost of government. Their reaction would be different. Writing it down on the PFD, they don't. They pay hardly anything um, uh, in terms of the cost of government. It all gets shifted to middle and lower income Alaska families. If we did a flat tax or some other form of tax that reached the top 20%, they would pay an increasing amount of their income uh, toward the cost of government. If, for example, uh, uh, at the level of a billion dollars in PFD cuts, which is about what we had uh, last year, to fund that through a flat tax would be would be four percent of adjusted gross income. And if you had the top twenty percent, if you had Natasha uh, and others that had to pay four percent 
of their adjusted gross income toward the cost of government, they would have an entirely different attitude, uh, in my view, about about those costs and bringing down those costs uh, than they do currently. The, 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 the concept that we're just going to ride down the PFD, the concept that some people have that we're just going to let to continue to ride down the PFD, we're going to continue to talk about cuts only, but at the end of the day, the, when the legislature doesn't do that, we're just going to take it out of the PFD. That concept, in my mind, ensures that we're not going to have any significant level of PFD cuts because the people who, who could make the PFD, any significant level of spending cuts, excuse me, because the people who could make the spending cuts happen, the top 20%, the people who are in charge of the legislature, the donor class that, that, that has a huge influence uh, on the legislature, the people that, that could make those spending cuts happen aren't going to do it because they're not feeling the impact and, they, and they're not going to spend their political capital uh, to make it happen as long as they can dodge it. We keep hearing this discussion of a sales tax, and uh, you actually laid out this chart that uh, I have posted up in the chat room for people who want to see it. But you're talking about the amount of revenue per year, and if you go all the way up to taking essentially 100% of the PFD, which uh, Ed King has laid out as a distinct possibility if we move forward with this and we just keep uh, business as usual going on in the size and scope of government, they will consume essentially all of the PFD within just a couple of years. You're talking about to try and offset with something like that by sales tax. Something like 23% uh, of a tax would have to be levied to be able to do that. So, I mean, that the, the, like you said, the PFD has become this juicy slush fund, $2.1 billion, that they just see as basically their piggy bank. They've already burned through $14 billion on the other side. $2.1 billion a year seems like a pretty good deal for them. It does. I mean, so so they get to act. <laughs> I had a conversation with somebody where uh, they were referring to the top 20 percent as sort of and the legislators who represent the top 20 percent in the legislature is sort of the the betters. Right. In the in the Downton Abbey sense the, that they know better than than anybody else how to spend how to spend this money. And and as long as they're spending other people's money which is what they're doing by, by using the PFD as a slush fund, as long as they're spending other people's money, they'll continue to say, well, we know where this money should go. It, we know better than you uh, where this money should go, and we'll spend the money there. That will be their attitude. If they, if, as long as they can spend other people's money, they will continue to spend it. They will, they will have all sorts of rationales for why they're doing it and why it's better for Alaska overall to spend it uh, in this fashion, then let it go to middle and lower income Alaska families. Um, and, and we'll just keep going down this road until you get, until Jennifer Johnson's um, uh, 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 donor class uh, is, is made to feel the hit, Jennifer Johnson won't care about continued PFD cuts. She will just view it as a way of, be of, of directing that money to, to, to a better end result. The second you start, you start, taxing Jennifer Johnson's donor class to pay for government, you will see an entirely different attitude uh, in, in house finance. Um, right. Sales taxes, I mean, some people do talk about sales taxes, but sales taxes are regressive. They push most of the cost of middle and lower income Alaska families. It's sort of the top 20%'s backup plan. If for some reason they got they got stymied on 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 using the PFD uh, they just go to a sales tax and say, "Oh, well, now we got taxes," and you know. Right. Uh, but but they're not they're not having to pay as much as middle and lower income Alaska families. It's still a still a good deal for them. The only way we're going to stop this, and, and we do stop it, if we if we if we have a tax that reaches the the top twenty percent as well as well as the remaining eighty percent, at 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 a very early point, uh, they're going to say, "No, we can't stand that anymore. Cut spending." As long as they're able to push it off on PFD cuts and push it down to middle and lower income Alaska families, we are not going to see that. Chris says Brad has a point for the short term for a short term budget solution, but what about the long term? How would an income tax increase not cause a higher demand in government services in the long term? Oh, it's simple. I mean, you get you tax the the top twenty percent uh, at at a two percent or a three percent or a four percent. Uh, a rate on on their adjusted gross income, they're going to say we need to stop spending, uh, and they have the they have the ability to do it. They have the political capital be, to be able to push back, support candidates, fund candidates 
uh, to push back on on spending growth uh, and keep that spending down. They have an incentive to do it. They have the they, and they have an incentive to use their political capital um, to do it. Right now, they don't. And and right now, it's just it's just the middle and lower income classes who are seeing the PFD cuts that are trying to push back on it. But they don't have the political strength to push back on on uh, on on that on that spending growth. Uh, top 20 percent is in control of the legislature. They'll just keep spending other people's money. You make it their money. Uh, you you make it their money that they're having to spend. And they will find ways. They will find ways to cut back. Jonathan has. I think he's offering probably one of the only viable options towards the cut only method when he says getting the PFD enshrined is the number one priority. Once that is off the table, then cutting would work because the donor class would then be on the hook because there'd be no other option. That would be off the table. Yeah, absolutely right. But we're not going to get the PFD enshrined in the Constitution, um, and so the question is. Because because the top twenty percent isn't going to allow that to happen because they don't want to give up on that source of revenues, so the question is how do you otherwise address this problem? If we don't, if we can't address it uh, uh, through making the top twenty set twenty percent pay, realize the cost of government through through contributions that they make. Uh, if we can't do that, then they're just going to continue to ride down the PF. We got time to sneak in a little bit about number three, which is the eight million pound gorilla in the room, which nobody's really talking about the existential threat. Uh, you and I have talked about it before, but it seems to be on the back burner. Nobody's really thinking about it. And that existential threat is, of course, pension plans. And we're talking specifically here about the retirement program. Uh, this is a worldwide problem that could come home to roost in Alaska, just like everywhere else. It, it will come home to roost in Alaska. What what the concern is, what the realization is, as as bond rates fall, as as interest rates fall, and as bond returns fall, uh, there the 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 money that these pension plans generate through their investments is falling as well. Uh, and with that fall, you've got to make it up from someplace else, and it's going to come from the general fund. So we're going to have more more pressure on the general fund to spend the money it takes to keep the pension pension funds afloat. And that's the one thing that we really haven't even been talking about. I mean, we've already been paying into it. They've paid oodles of money into it over the years. It's still unfunded to the tune of somewhere in the $8 billion range. And when those things start to really go south, uh, they're going to look to the state to fund that. In fact, they're going to, you know, there'll be lawsuits and everything else. The state will have to pay it. And yep. uh, and that's the thing that nobody's really talking about right now. 3030, I think, was the year that we talked about it, but it could be sooner than that. Brad, this uh, pension problem is is really going to be the thing that uh, that is going to come up and, and everybody will act like, oh, well, this is such a surprise to us. You know, we can't believe that this. Why didn't future? Why didn't past generations? Why didn't we look? Why didn't we listen? Uh, billions and billions of dollars unfunded. Uh, of this liability, and yet we still got people out there who are pushing, continuously pushing for us to return to a defined benefits program and everything else as a way to retain employees. But we've still got this huge problem, which is still not yet come to bite us in the butt. It's going to, though. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, the pension, the, the, the everything in the budget is sort of controllable in a way, except for the pension uh, payments. And the pension payments are rising at something like six or seven percent per year, as it is, based upon the assumption that the that the existing pension fund is going to earn a, a six or a seven percent rate of return uh, uh, on an ongoing basis and generate that income off their investment to sort of fund the pensions that way, in addition to the in addition to the, the contributions that, that are coming from the uh, from the the spending side. The problem is. Here, it, there, there's nothing. There's nothing in life that doesn't affect something else. So, as as the Fed and as the president and as as uh, as as forces in the world have pushed interest rates lower and lower and lower, uh, the returns being generated uh, by uh, pension funds have gone lower and lower and lower, and the expectation that they would generate a sufficient amount of funding. Out of their existing uh, existing principal um, uh, and a, a sufficient amount of funding to pay off the pensions is 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 evaporating. The consequence of that uh, worldwide, but uh, but brought down to Alaska, the consequence of that is that is it has to those those 
the failed expectations, the, the failure of the, of the pension funds to grow through investments has to be supplemented then by increased funds coming out of the, the spending side, out of the, out of the legislature side, uh, over into the pension funds to keep them whole, to keep them capable of, uh, of, of meeting their obligations uh, going forward. And we already, we already are in a hole uh, on the on the spending side in terms of pension funds, we have a as I say, the the spending is growing at the rate of six or seven percent uh, per year uh, in order to make up the hole that's over on the pension side uh, in the first place. Uh, you um, uh, uh, don't uh, uh, have that sort of growth going on in the pension funds. You've got to increase what's coming out of the out of the spending side, out of the legislature side. Uh, to continually try to catch up and keep that hole uh, patched up on the on the pension fund side, and so that's just I mean we're as as you see this problem evolving or un unfolding in the world generally, we've got a very serious problem ourselves uh, that grows up on that side. One other uh, small piece of that is is the lower interest rates. Uh, uh, people are suggesting that that results in lower returns, overall returns going forward. It has an effect on the equity markets as well, and equity returns come down. If that's the case, then the permanent fund returns, the returns on the permanent fund that people are counting on to fund government and fund the PFD are going to go down as well. And while we're sort of fixed on this 5% return, 5% uh, draw uh, under SB26, uh, that's assuming that that the that the permanent fund returns, the real rate of return on the permanent fund continues at around uh, that rate. If that if that realized real rate of return goes down, then then the returns from the permanent fund, the the uh, the input from the permanent fund. So we we could be facing a, a situation in which we're getting hit from the spending side, the need for increased funding to come over to to plug the gap on the on the on the pers and ters amounts. So we're hitting, getting hit from the spending side, and we could get hit from the revenue side in terms of reduced returns coming from the permanent fund. It's, it, it, is, it is a world crisis that, that has very serious implications at home, uh, and, and sort of the world's waking up to it now. We sort of need to be factoring it in from the standpoint of, of our state government as well. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thanks for your thoughts on this. We appreciate it. As always, a good thought-provoking discussion. Uh, we appreciate you being part of it today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.